disease. Less than a week ago when I spoke to Mr. Devesh and Nadwal first, you know, I was very sanguine about the whole thing and I said, you know, we don't need to worry too much about this condition. It's not going to hit us too hard. We've had similar scares with the H1N1 and earlier with SARS and with the MERS. But now I realize that it's not quite as simple as those conditions were. Incidentally, we're still faced with a greater problem with H1N1. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you today applies as much to H1N1. It's important that the cleanliness and the order that you see in this campus has translated across the country that we expect to find this particular condition. So Donald Rumsfeld, the former Secretary of Defense, you know, made that statement. Can I have the next slide? He said there are known knowns. These are the things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. These are the things that we know that we don't know. But then he talked about the unknowns, unknowns. And we don't even know that we don't know about them. And I think in the beginning of any condition like this, whether you're talking about it being an epidemic or a pandemic, there are a lot of these unknown unknowns. And while people generally laugh at Donald Rumsfeld for saying this, I think this is one of the rare occasions where he actually made some sense. Can I have the next slide, please? So the coronavirus belongs to a family of viruses. It's not just one virus. There are several viruses. And if we swap the throat of everyone here, we'll probably get one or two species of coronavirus. Because it's responsible for the ordinary cold. And we've all had colds. There's no person in the world who's not, not had a common cold. And that's coronavirus too. But this particular avatar of the virus seems to be a little more worrying. And if you look at the coronavirus, it's so-called because it's got this spike of proteins all around, which are like a crown around the virus, and that's what corona means, crown. And the crown is where the virus attaches onto us and then injects its RNA, the nucleic acid, into the cell and starts doing the damage. So it starts with that crown, and we shouldn't look, ignore that aspect of this virus. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, one of the peculiar things about viruses, and especially RNA viruses, is they mutate very frequently. The genetic structure changes. So before the body can mount a good response to it, viruses often changed in some ways. And that's the difficulty of why we never become resistant. We never develop, develop immunity against the coronavirus. And that's why we'll always get colds. Fortunately, some of these other viruses, the non-cold coronaviruses, it looks like we can develop immunity, especially against those protein spikes that form the corona that I mentioned earlier. So there's hope. It's not as bad as the common cold in terms of the immunity we can develop against it. And as I said earlier, it's been circulating for decades among humans and they cause a wide range of diseases. Can I have the next slide? No, no, this one. Go back, please. Yeah. So at the left you have, as I said, the common cold, which is very, very widespread, ubiquitous, every part of the world. With the extreme right you have MERS, now COVID-19, and the SARS virus. And this all just belongs to the same spectrum of viruses. So who can get infected? Virtually anybody, whether you're young or old, man or woman, wherever you are in the world, you can get infected with the coronavirus. And everybody, as I said, already has some coronavirus. And this virus is going to form that same kind of pattern that it's going to spread across the world, which is why the WHO has already called it a pandemic. Slide two. The next slide. So these are the symptoms that you see. You probably can't see the slide. It's a little too small, but it tells you what happens in the early stages and the late stages. So on the right hand, the slide tells you that in the early stage, you have fever. And unlike the flu, this is usually a fairly low grade of fever. You just feel a little chilly, you feel a little feverish. It's not a very high fever. It's not the 102s, 103s in the early stage. And then accompanying this, you either have respiratory symptoms because it enters through the nose or mouth and gets into the lungs. And from the mouth, it can also work its way into the stomach and intestines. So you get either lung symptoms, upper respiratory symptoms, that is the nose and throat, or it can go down into your gut and give you diarrhea. So the common symptoms are cough, slight runny nose, sore throat maybe, some shortness of breath. Since the virus spreads to the body, it affects the muscles and causes a lot of muscle aches and pains. 
It can also cause headache. And of course, with enters the stomach and intestines, it can cause some vomiting and diarrhea. But those are the early symptoms. As you move into the second week and a little later, that's when some people, not all of them, a few people develop pneumonia and bronchitis. And that's what causes the breathlessness. It causes cough. People start to cough up a little sputum, which was not there in the earlier stages. And then they bring out, they break out into this breathlessness, pneumonia. That drops their oxygen and causes the problems. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, the next slide. Yeah, so you see there that it's not one of the most contagious diseases. So that little box that you have uh, doesn't predict very well with that, but the COVID 19, is not the next week, which you can see here, is neither the most uh, contagious of all viruses because. The average number of people infected by one sick person is not very high. It's about 1.5 to 3.5, so roughly 2 to 2.5. Much, much less than many of the other infections that we come across. So it's an infection. It spreads from one person to the other, but it's not the most infective of all viruses. The next slide on the right side shows you that the majority of infections are minor. So you take the virus, let's not get too scared of it. More than 80%, more than 4 in 5 infections tend to be mild. But a lot of patients actually don't even have symptoms. Okay, so that's something that you need to keep in mind. Something good about it, that it doesn't affect people too much. The only problem is people with mild symptoms think, oh, I don't have much of a problem, this can't be corona. Go out into the community and spread it when they have symptoms. Okay, so there's a little bit of good and a little bad about a very, very mild infection. The small, no, keep that slide on, please. Yeah. The small numbers, less than one in six, tend to have a more severe infection, and less than one in 20 have a critical infection. And when I'm talking about severe, these are the people who recover, may need to go into hospital. The ones who have a mild disease need not go into the hospital, they can be treated as an outpatient at home. It's only the critical ones who need to go to the ICU. And that, as I'll come to later, is not something that affects the population sitting here, except maybe those in the front row. The next slide is the majority of people recover. You know, more than half the people have already recovered. It's less than two months or two and a half months. And yet, most people have already recovered from this infection. So let's not get too frightened about this infection. And the right side slide, you see that those aged 60, are most at risk. Okay, younger people, as in this audience, as I mentioned, are not likely to have much of an infection. In fact, the death rate among people who are less than 15 years old is less than 1%. It's in the range of 0 0.0 to 0.4%. In the 50 pluses, it rises slightly. In the 60 pluses, it rises even more. And it's really only the 80 pluses who have a death rate of more than 1 in 5. Okay, or around 1 in 5. So, Let's not get too worried. Most people who contract the infection are going to have a mild or moderate infection. Very few are going to have a severe infection. And very, very, very few are actually going to die of the infection. On the right side, then we we'll move to the next slide. Yes. Yeah. So, among the risk factors are those who already have another disease. So, a person has a heart disease, has a heart failure, has bad lungs, maybe because of smoking, has bad liver or kidney disease, these are the people who are more susceptible. People who are otherwise healthy, and I think that applies to the vast, vast, vast majority of this audience, are not going to have a very serious problem. And this is very unlike H1N1, where young people are often affected, and the most severe disease we saw was mostly in the people who were in their late teens, early twenties, in fact, the demographic of this audience. And again, I highlight to you, Precautions that I'm going to tell you about you need to take for coronavirus are exactly the same that you need to take for H1N1. And that is something you really need to worry a little more about. But there are some good things about that which I'll come back to again later. The next slide please. So Ms. Prithvi was asking me about this myth that's floating around showing that most of the cities that were affected early were those that lie in that belt of about 40 degrees north latitude doesn't affect the 40 degrees south latitude, which has a similar temperature. And you can see that the yellow band is where most of the infections lie. However, can I have the next slide, please? 
Most people use this. It's the next slide, please. To spreading the myth that COVID-19 will die out in summer and it will not reach warm countries like India. They said Bangalore is already hot, Chennai is even hotter. It's not going to affect us. Let's not accept that. This is data from the WHO, which actually says it is being transmitted in hot and humid climates. Let's not think that we're going to be immune and relax too much and not take precautions. The next slide. Now, this you can't see very clearly, but it just shows how quickly the COVID virus is spread. You know, we're talking about the beginning there, it is from January 21st. Here we are on March 12th. And we already have a lack of 25,000 cases all over the world. Not India. This is worldwide data. But that's the worry, that it is spread. It is spread rapidly. And when it, any virus spreads very rapidly through the community, it can spread because people have no immunity against it. And all of us who lack immunity are susceptible to it. Not that we're going to get it. We are going to be susceptible to it. Okay, so this is the problem with the rapidly spreading virus. So one of the strategies that governments are going to use is to try and slow down the spread and I'll come back to this later. Okay, how does it compare with seasonal flu? I've been telling you that seasonal flu is a greater problem. Can I have the next slide? The next slide, please. Yeah, so when you compare it with seasonal flu, which is the data on the left, and those are the different groups, different ages, you'll find that COVID-19 affects a lot more people. Okay, so that... You know, if you look at the 60 plus year olds, more than 4% are affected, much less than those who died with uh, seasonal influenza. But seasonal influenza affects a lot more people. In fact, my infectious diseases colleague yesterday was, you know, trying to highlight to the management that every year, every year, God knows how long, there have been at least 20,000 deaths in the United States alone due to seasonal influenza. We are nowhere near that number with the coronavirus. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, so why is there breathing difficulty? It's just because the lungs are affected. The lungs get flooded with fluid, which turns solid, and it really becomes difficult to breathe. Oxygen doesn't get into the blood, and the person is panting for breath. And this is often the first sign that things are turning bad. It's gone beyond a mild infection. And this is the time to start, you know, some kind of supportive treatment, and maybe get the person into hospital. Until that point, there really is no need to go into a hospital risk spreading the infection to others. The next slide, please. So having learned all this, what should one do? And this is really the question I think all of us are interested in. What do you do? So the more things change, can I have the next slide? The more things change, the more they remain the same. And that's what that French sentence says. And on the left side, you have a plague doctor from the 16th, 17th century. This is what they wore during the plagues, which wiped out about a third of the countries cities that they affected. London's population was reduced to almost one third. Many other countries, cities, I don't know how many of you know, but in Bangalore there's a road called Plague Road. This is from the late 19th century when plague affected Bangalore and to give people work they gave them, they built that road and had the plague asylum there. Okay, so plague is something that has always been with humankind. And the modern suits that we use are very similar to what the plague doctors used to use to guard themselves against it. And most people do not be this way. This is only for the doctors who are looking after hundreds of plague cases. And these are only for those who look after patients in the ICU. Not even for me when I'm sitting in the outpatient. Next slide, please. So one of the things I was very happy to see when I walked in is nobody greeted me with a handshake. Everybody greeted me with a namaste. Brother Simon did the same when we walked into the room. So that's something we need to go back to. We need to follow the Namaste culture. Because the fastest way we can spread the virus is by touching your nose or mouth, shaking hands with another person when you have the infection. But if the other person has the infection, you touch his hands, the virus is a very sticky virus. Thanks to those spikes on the virus that we saw, which formed the corona, that gets transferred onto your skin, sticks to your skin through the spikes, and makes its way into your body. So avoid touching other people as much as possible. Avoid touching surfaces like this. It's already been contaminated this morning by at least five other people. Okay, if even one of them had had the virus, then all of us are at risk of picking it up. And now if I touch my face, I'm going to get the infection. I see about 30 or 40 patients in the day, I'm at risk of giving it 
So avoid touching surfaces unnecessarily, and certainly don't touch your face after touching your any other surface. Practice hand hygiene at all times, and I'll come back to this. Your hands are the main thing we touch, touch other surfaces, touch our faces. We are a very manual species, so the hands must be kept clean at all times, washing multiple times, and using a hand sanitizer multiple times. And again, I was impressed when I came in, I was offered a hand sanitizer. Avoid close contact with anybody showing symptoms of respiratory disease. So there's no need to avoid close contact. Be friends, go out with people who have perfectly good health. But when a person starts to show signs, even of a common cold, you don't know what it is, that person should avoid the company of others. And you should avoid the company of that person, providing all care at a slight distance. Wear a mask only if you have respiratory symptoms. It does not help you to wear a mask at all times. Maintain safe food practices, that is, eat well food, food which has been prepared hygienically. Avoid travel to farms, live animal markets, or where animals are slaughtered. Animals do not give it, to, give it to humans. Now all the transmission is human to human, so let's not worry too much. Do not think that it's transmitted by the Chinese only. It has nothing to do with the Chinese any longer. Let's not discriminate against anyone. Next slide, please. So those are the general precautions you need to take. Increasingly, we're talking about social distancing, which is maintain at least a two-arm distance from others, especially when they have the infection. And it's thought that this is enough because the virus travels in droplets. It cannot travel individually. And these droplets, when a person coughs or sneezes, there's a huge cloud of viruses that comes out, but they cannot travel. These droplets cannot travel more than six feet. So if you can maintain a distance of six feet from anybody who's coughing or sneezing, or even has a fever, I think that's a very, very good practice. Maintain a distance to occupants six feet, I said. How do you measure six feet? One arm's length is roughly two feet. So you can measure two to three arm's length from another person. And generally, that will provide enough safety, provided you go, don't go sit in the same place and touch his arm, the arms of his armchair after he's been sitting in, in it. Okay, so surfaces and human beings and the cough can all spread the infection. The next slide, please. And we really need to learn how to queue in India. On the top, you have a queue in uh, the UK, and in the bottom, you have what passes for a queue in India. And I was recently in Tirupati, and people were pushing into me, wondering why I was keeping a three-foot distance from the person in front. I was paunched throughout. Once a man's paunch kept pushing me throughout the queue till I reached the main uh, sanctum sanctorum. So, queuing is something we learned to me, and the queuing is with a three-foot distance. I learned this the hard way in the UK when I went to a post office, and I saw a huge crowd of people outside. And like, this was my first day in the UK, I walked into the post office, and why people are standing outside, and I saw a queue inside. Fortunately, my training in St. Joseph's taught me that I need to get out and join the end of the queue. And this was winter, so we were standing outside in the bitter cold, everybody with their hands like that shivering, but they maintained the three distance personal space, gave each person personal space. So it's very important that we try and follow this. Please queue with a three foot distance at least between one person and the other, and enforce queues in it. Next slide, please. As I was saying, wash your hands quickly. Wash with soap and water. Nothing is as good as soap and water. Obviously, it will turn your hands very dry, so you can use a lotion. And practically all hand sanitizers are alcohol based. Mr. Devesh Agarwal very impressively gave me the contents of the sanitizer, which I can't recall. I only know it contains two types of alcohol and reaches a net concentration of 70%. And that's what you need to use. You need to use something which is at least 70% alcohol. And it works best when it's allowed to dry. And don't wipe it off. Allow the sanitizer to dry after we use it. They all contain a little bit of lanolin, so the skin doesn't get chapped and dry. Because cracked skin allows viruses to enter. Okay, so just hand washing is not enough. Also use a hand sanitizer. May I have the next slide, please? Yeah, so it's a very nice comic that the Indian government, which is actually is doing some pretty impressive work of late on how to wash your hands. And I'm going to take you through it because I think it is very useful. Can I have the next slide? Yeah, so indeed, the little starts left top. 
with water and soap. That's all you need. You don't need anything more aggressive. Please don't use bleach and destroy your skin. What you do is put your soap and water, then wash palm to palm. Wash between the fingers, including the back of the fingers and the wet spaces. Focus on the thumbs, rubbing like that, because that often gets neglected. Wash the back of the hands, and then rub the back of the hands together. Focus on the wrist, because things spread from the wrist to the rest of the hand. And finally, either you allow it to dry off, or you wipe it with a clean towel. And this whole act, you can do once or twice, but it must be washed for at least 20 seconds. How do you time 20 seconds? You can do it the traditional way, which is 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, to reach 21,000. Or you can sing uh, two happy birthdays. A happy birthday song lasts 10 seconds. So two happy birthdays, so everybody has a happy birthday this year, the next year, and the year after that. Okay, so this is the hand washing part. Next slide, please. The virus can sit on surfaces 6 to 12 hours, maybe even longer. The appropriate circumstances, even a couple of days. So we need to clean and disinfect frequently touched items and surfaces. You can use a regular household spray. You can use a sanitary wipe, a hand sanitation wipe. You know the alcohol-based soft wipes that you get. And Avoid touching your hands, eyes, with your hands, your eyes, nose, or mouth with unwashed hands. Before you touch your face, and it's so easy, unwittingly, to touch your face. This is a nice video, I'm sure all of you saw it on WhatsApp, where this lady was announcing, please do not touch your hands with your hands, your face, and nose. Then, before turning the page, licks her fingers and turns the page. Worst possible thing you can do. Okay, so please take precautions. What I have started to do is try and pull my fingers together so I don't accidentally scratch my face. Before I can unloose my hands and touch my face, I have to consciously unlink my fingers. So that I find fairly useful. Next slide, please. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Take care of your loved ones even if they are sick. But take appropriate precautions. And avoid close contact as much as possible. And if you are sick, please stay that's very, very important. This is how infection spread through people who are infected and give the infection to others. The next slide, please. Okay, cough etiquette. Again, something we don't do in India. Everybody just coughs loudly. Throughout Tirupati, I was coughed on by many people. Uh, I guess I was coughing and, you know, it's not very pleasant to be coughed on by about 30 or 40 people. Fortunately, we didn't have the problem then. So cover your mouth and nose when you cough or sneeze. And how do you cough or sneeze? You can use a tissue, but after you sneeze or cough into it, don't put it back in your pocket, because that's the surest way of transferring it to your hand, transferring the virus to your pocket. And the next time your hand goes into your pocket or your bag, you're going to pick up the infection and transfer it to somebody else or to your mouth or to a surface. So immediately after that, throw the tissue into a covered trash bin, the Narayana Langford town, we've decided to have pedal bins with uh, uh, some Dettol at the base and we can dispose of this. Dettol, interestingly, as they've told you, on the bottle, kills the coronavirus. Okay, but that's with the appropriate concentration. Throw the tissue into a covered trash bin. But perhaps a much better way to do it is to cough into your hand like this. So you go. Sneeze into your hand. And one of the reasons I didn't wear a coat today is I can wash the shirt when I go home. I can't wash a coat that easy. Okay, so I think one of the good things to do for all the gentlemen sitting in front, start avoiding wearing blazers and coats and start using your shirt sleeve to cough into. And the same for the ladies too. Because your clothes, especially your clothes, shirts, you know, kurtas, we wash every day. We do not wash blazers and coats at all. So try and avoid using that, and coughing to the hand is probably the tightest thing and avoids, you know, spreading the infection to others. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the nightmare. I don't know if you've taken something to do that. Just click on it and do it. This is the scene we very often see in India. So this was described as the world's shortest horror film. That's the problem. Okay, so do not spit. The 
virus is adequately killed when you swallow it and you have good acid in your stomach and you can't spread it to yourself, you already have it. So please do not spit outside. Next slide please. Yeah. Self-quarantine, it may take up to 14 days to actually develop symptoms. It can be as little as two days, it can be as long as 14 days. So if you've been exposed definitely to the virus, stay at home for 14 days. There's no shorter period and there are no shortcuts. You can't say I'm just going to go out and spend some time with friends anyway, I don't have symptoms. If you've definitely been exposed to a person who's been diagnosed to have COVID-19 infection, please quarantine yourself. China, it was enforced with great uh, diligence, with great strictness, and you know, very, very obtrusively, they actually jailed people, and the reports that some people tried to leave their homes were arrested and even shot. Italy did not do it. The day after the Italian government announced lockdown, the streets of Milan were full of people shopping, enjoying themselves, drinking, dancing. And that's why Italy has the fastest growing rate of COVID-19. This is a disease that's controllable as long as we are disciplined about it. So you stay informed, do not panic. Get your information not from the WhatsApp University, but get it from official organizations. Official organizations, the Ministry of Family Health, Health and Family Welfare, India, the government of India, and even the state, the CDC, and the WHO. These give you authentic information. Don't be tempted to panic by getting information from somebody who's mean, who doesn't understand what he's doing. It's taken me about, it took me 15 years to become a pathologist, and subsequently I have another 25 years. So I'm talking from a world of experience that does not come overnight by somebody who decides to key something into his phone. Next slide, please. When should you seek medical help? Don't go to hospital. That's where you're going to get infections. Don't go to your doctor unnecessarily. If something can wait, postpone it. I'm not saying avoid something which is dangerous. But don't go to just have... Every day I get people saying, Sumne check up on Bande. You, know? you don't need checkups at this point in time. Don't go to the hospital unnecessarily. Leave that space for people who are really sick. And don't give them infections. Don't pick up infections from so if you have symptoms, stay at home, use a mask, avoid close contact with others. If you have a troublesome cough, seek medical help. And of course, if you're short of breath, immediately seek medical help. Shortness of breath is a bad symptom. And where should you go? Currently, the place to go to is either the Rajiv Gandhi Institute of Chest Diseases down the road, behind them hands, or go to the Bagro Medical College uh, Research Institute, which is near City Market. And those are the only two places which have testing facilities. There's a WhatsApp message doing the rounds and Narayana Health has the testing facilities, we don't. At most, we can collect the sample and send it to one of these two places. It's much better to go directly there because we don't have the testing kits and we have not been given the testing kits yet. Next slide, please. Face masks were actually designed to help the surgeon not transmit his infection to the patient. When you open up the abdomen, the abdomen is a nice sterile place. You open up the chest, the chest by and large is a sterile place. Doctors don't get infections, surgeons don't get infections from patients, except very, very rarely, not unless they cut themselves. So the mask is to prevent me from breathing into the patient's chest or abdomen when it's open. Okay, not the other way around. So don't use it to stop yourself getting infection. But when you have an infection, please use it to prevent yourself from giving it to others. Three ply surgical masks are enough. There's a shortage of all kinds of masks. We are having to stitch cloth masks, which I last saw when I was an intern about 35 years ago. Okay, so don't please buy a mask unnecessarily. It doesn't help you and it deprives people who have the infection of getting it. N95 masks are only needed by doctors and that too when they're performing a special procedure, which is going to cause what is called aerosolization. The virus rises into the air. And do not use up masks unnecessarily. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, so paper, this is from the Ministry of Health and Family Medicine, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. Just to tell you that persons having no symptoms are not to use masks. And I'm very happy to see nobody here is using a mask, it's unnecessary. Next slide, please. In such situation, the, the, the advice that I gave you earlier of wash hands frequently, especially if they're dirty or soil, don't just use a hand sanitizer. Wash and then use a sanitizer. You will cough into your flexed elbow or into a tissue which you dispose of. 
refrain from touching your hand uh, to your face, stay under the rule, monitor your body temperature. This is all you need to do. And remember the body temperature is a pretty useful, useless thing because it's a very mild rising temperature. Next slide please. When and who should use a medical mask? Apart from a healthcare worker, only when a person develops cough or fever, or somebody who's caring very closely, and somebody who needs that help, and who has cough or fever. I think that in summary is what that says. And for all these people, a triple layer mask is enough. You don't need an N95 mask. Next slide, please. How do you wear a mask? If you ever have to wear a mask, there's this particular way of doing it. I'm not going to teach you now. This is the well on the net. This is a particular procedure. As far as possible, do not touch the outside of the mask when you're exposing it. Do not touch the inside of the mask before putting it on. Wash your hands before putting it on. Wash your hands before taking it on. Next slide, please. And dispose of it very quickly. Some don'ts, and I'm coming to the last few slides, and then a few messages for our industry leaders here. There is no vaccine. You're hearing a lot of nonsense about Israel having made a vaccine. If it is, if they have, and they started six months ago, one year ago, then there may be some way on the way to developing a vaccine. Vaccines don't develop overnight. They have to go through heavy testing, make sure they are safe and effective. Do not post messages. It's very, very important because it's a temptation to quickly forward a message. Do not post messages in increase the Forward only messages that come from WHO, CDC, or Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Do not forward messages from anywhere else. Next slide, please. Why is it such a panic? Because look at the number of references in social media to COVID-19. 1.1 billion forwards. On the other hand, something that starts, you know, 15 to 20 years ago, we only 56 million, which is why we never panicked about SARS. We are panicking about COVID only because of the forwards on social media. Don't add to the panic. Next slide, please. How big a problem is it? Look at the number of disease deaths per day worldwide. Tuberculosis, leading, 3014. How many people have forwarded even one message on tuberculosis? COVID-19, down there, 56. That's all, deaths per day. Okay, so we're panicking unnecessarily about things that we shouldn't panic about and not bothering about things that we really should be caring about. Hepatitis B, how many people here have got a hepatitis B shot in their childhood? Very few. Okay, that's the second largest infective killer. These are not all causing death, these are infective causes of death, preventable causes of death. Next slide, please. And as I said, don't go around buying up all the masks, preventive medicines, and hand sanitizers in sight. They will be available if you allow time for them to be manufactured. And this is that's again a message to the Business community, let's start manufacturing most of the things where there is a health need. Next slide, please. So somebody posted this interesting message. It was one of the few questions I thought worth forwarding. So with the peak to have bought up 27 bottles of soap, leaving none on the shop shelves for others. You do realize that to stop getting coronavirus, you need other people to wash their hands too. Okay, so we all are in this together. We should look after each other, not just ourselves. There's no way you can predict yourself others are not safe. Next slide. What about the companies? There are some fairly frightening statistics out there. This is from an American Hospitals Association webinar that happened recently. So they are expecting the United States by the time this thing plays out to have 480,000 deaths. Close to half a million deaths. Given our population we have a lot more. Okay. So let's be prepared for Community epidemic wave took about two months. That's what we are expecting. The number of cases requiring mandatory support is about 1% of these. We don't have enough ventilators. We don't have enough ICUs. We need to gear up. And I think industry should hold hands with government. Figuratively, not actually holding hands. We don't want people to hold hands now. Is to help government set up these places. Because that protects you. It protects your business protects the economy of the country. Next slide, please. And this very clever man, I don't like him, he's a creep, but he said, never let a good crisis go to waste. We're in the middle of a crisis. Let's turn it to our advantage. What can we do? Next slide, please. These are what is projected in each country. And I'll come to the next slide. Notice UK is down there close to the bottom of these European countries, which all have excellent health services. Next slide. So this is the timeline of events, and I just want to point you to the red triangle. That's when China introduced a lockdown. 
And immediately after that, two new cases started to fall. They subsequently started testing more and picked up more cases in the orange bars. The green bars show you that true new cases stop. Can we enforce a lockdown in India? We can't. Okay, China is different from India. Our discipline is different. Our political system, thank God, is different. We cannot enforce a lockdown. And I don't think we should. We cannot enforce lockdowns here. So what can we do? Next slide. So these are the things that we can do in the industry. Work from home as much as possible have smaller groups of people in the hospital and transmission from one person to the other becomes less. At the workplace, try and distance. I've requested our people in our uh, Langfordown clinic to space apart the waiting areas. People are not sitting more than a meter closer than necessary. Provide hand sanitizers at the entrance to the building and at various spots and, you know, educate people to use them. You educate people about this condition and work with the government and health authorities, otherwise they'll be overwhelmed soon. I'm hearing horror stories from our fellow pulmonology, pulmonologist friends in Italy, that they're overwhelmed, they're neglecting old people, and they're focusing all their efforts on those who can be saved, who don't have any problems. So when an elderly person with a heart condition comes into the ER, they're not even looked at. They said, go home, we can't do anything for you. Ventilators are reserved for people who can be saved. So it's very, very important that you know, we all come together to fight this. Next slide, please. So this is a term that the British are using, and I think they've accepted that, yes, it's going to come, we're going to face it. How best do we face it? That line that you see, that, that horizontal dash line, is the capacity of the healthcare system. If an infection rapidly spreads, it's going to overwhelm the system after the infection dies out. Okay, and that's what's happening in Italy. This has had a huge surge in cases. The next slide. Britain is trying to flatten this curve. So if we can slow down transmission by the methods that I said, social distancing, washing hands, no vaccine around, then we can at least slow down the rate at which it spreads and we always have adequate healthcare facilities to manage, you know, to take hold of this condition and to keep it under manageable proportions. Next slide. Okay, I'm not going to go into this because it's taken plenty of time. This is a story about a farmer who shared his best seed corn with his neighbors. And he was scolded and said, you're giving them the best corn. He said, unless they have the best corn, their pollen will come into my field and make my corn worse. So this is just a way of saying the last thing. The fact is, none of us truly wins until all of us win. And that's something we need to keep for the rest of this epidemic or pandemic. And it's something we probably need to keep for the rest of our lives. This habit of looking after each other, and all of us do well with this. The next slide, please. So, thank you very much for this very patient listening, and let's beat this virus. So that's what we've done very, very successfully with the polio virus. So what we did was we gave every single child in the country twice a year over the last couple of decades polio virus. This is a live polio virus. So the baby gets the very, very low level of infection. It's not really infection, it doesn't produce problems. It, spreads from the baby's feces. It spreads the baby actually poops it out. It spreads in the community because we have uh, not many clean water supply services. And other children who actually didn't receive the virus and adults get again a very, very low level of this virus which gives them immunity. So there's an immunity across the herd of animals of human beings. And that's what we're hoping to achieve. It's once it reaches a certain level, Herd immunity kicks in and the virus stops spreading. We'll still get isolated cases in those who are immunosuppressed, for example, have had a transplant, have bad blood cancers or other diseases. People with diabetes, for example, have a lower level of immunity because of the disease. So they may still get the infection, but when you can bring it down to a small manageable number, the virus tends to die out and doesn't spread easily at all. Currently, the problem is none of us have immunity. One person gets it, it can spread to 10 others or 15 others. Okay, so we're trying to raise the level of herd immunity. And that's the British government strategy, but I think it's a very, very sensible strategy. Americans are not following it. Surprise, surprise, Trump is in charge. But the strategy that the Chinese were followed is not applicable in any other country other than North Korea. And the great worry, and I think the British are sensible about saying this, is if we lock down, nobody gets immunity. And then the virus is going to stage a comeback and we're going to have to go through this all over again. So it's actually
actually sensible to let a low level of infection persist in the community and perhaps, and this sounds cruel, accept that you know, some people will get infected, a small number of people will die, but hopefully this will be only the ones who are already very, very sick, maybe have a year or two ahead of them, they go a little earlier. We are reserving our facilities, our resources for those who can benefit from it more. A person who is 25 has another 50 years ahead of him, we would rather spend those resources on him, rather on her, rather than 89 years old. Anyway, it's probably not going to survive a year. It's cruel, but that's nature. Right, and if there are no more questions, it means I've done either a brilliant job or I've gone over everyone's head, so I'll stop at this point.